Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us on this glorious Wednesday, our final History is Lunch of the season. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium here in the two Mississippi museums. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones for this program. Uh, let me remind you of some programs coming up since we won't be meeting here again for a few months. At 6 p.m. tomorrow, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum will have the last of their Under the Light programs for 2019. This one focusing on the museum's final gallery, Where Do We Go From Here? Tomorrow evening, 6 p.m., that's free, of course. Then on Sunday, December 1st at 3 p.m., the Cathedral of St. Peter the Apostle Choir will perform holiday selections in the Old Capitol. That event is free, and the museum will host other events throughout the month. You can see what groups will be there on their Facebook page and other online sites. That same day, December 1st, the Model Trains and Model Town of Possum Ridge will open on the second floor of this building. Generations of Jacksonians have enjoyed this holiday tradition first at the Old Capitol Museum, then at the Winter Building, and as of last year in its new home here. That's free throughout December during regular museum hours. Bring your family for that. And mark your calendars for this year's Christmas by Candlelight Tour, which will be held Friday, December 6th from 4.30 to 8 p.m. This is a come and go open house at the Governor's Mansion, Old Capitol Museum, State Capitol, Manship House Museum, Welty House, Winter Building, and these museums. You can drive yourself or we'll have transportation running from site to site. That is one of the best holiday events of the year every year. And since this is our final History is Lunch program of 2019, I want to remind you that several of the department's sites and programs will be finalists in the Jackson Free Press's Best of Jackson contest. I believe the standard encouragement here is vote early, vote often. Uh, if History is Lunch wins, we'll have free cookies and coffee for everyone. <laughs> Today, we are delighted to have Rick Cleveland moderating a panel that will look at the history of the Southeastern Conference in Jackson. I'll say a few words about Rick, who will introduce the panel. A native of Hattiesburg, Cleveland is the most decorated sports journalist in Mississippi history. In more than 40 years as a sports editor and columnist, he has won scores of state, regional, and national awards for his writing and reporting. Bobby says you count some of his as yours. In 2011, Cleveland became the first sports writer to be honored with the Richard Wright Award for Literary Excellence. He is the former executive director of the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. Rick has talked to us before, of course, the first time after his biography of Boo Ferris was published, and most recently about his book, Mississippi's Greatest Athletes. We're happy to have him back today. Help me welcome Rick Cleveland in our panel. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I see some faces that we saw at the dedication earlier today, and uh, we're glad to have you here. I think it's a special day in Jackson that we're remembering an important part of, uh, of Mississippi history, not just Mississippi sports history, but uh, Mississippi history. I'd like to say one thing about uh, this, this history of this History is Lunch program I not only have been part of the program a couple of times, I come often, and it's the best bargain in town. Uh, it's, it's free, and it's always uh, great information, and if you're a history buff as I am, it's really special. I'm going to uh, take a moment and introduce who's on the panel today. Uh, to my immediate left is Bob Biggs. He is the grandson of the first uh, Commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, Mike Connor, Martin Senate, Mike Connor. Uh, to his left is John Cohen, who I first covered as a hot headed baseball player <laughs> for the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Uh, a great, a, a terrific player, and he's, uh, he's been a terrific coach and now a terrific athletic director. To his left is Larry Templeton who probably knows more about SEC history than, than anybody else here in the room. Uh, Larry was a longtime athletic director at Mississippi State who, when he first got the job, bailed him out of a huge mess. Uh, he's also going to be a member of the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame class of uh, 2020, and it's long overdue, but I'm glad he's going in. Uh, to Larry's left is Keith Carter, whom uh, I covered as a high-jumping 
sharpshooting off guard for Ole Miss and uh, on some of their greatest basketball teams. With both John and Keith, I knew they were, I didn't know they were going to be athletic directors, but I knew they were going to do something special because they were, they were, they were smart guys who were way beyond their years when they were playing sports in college. And to Keith's left, we're so happy to have Commissioner Greg Sankey of the Southeastern Conference here today. Uh, Greg is the eighth commissioner of the SEC, which to my mind, when, when you're talking about going back to 1940 until 2019, the fact that we've only had eight commissioners during that time uh, speaks to a lot of continuity and, uh, and probably a reason for a whole lot of the success that the SEC has had. You know, in 1940, Mike Connor, he, he had been the governor from 1932 to 1936. He led Mississippi uh, out of the Depression. Uh, my good friend uh, and my hero, William Winter, uh, counts Mike Connor as his inspiration uh, to get into public service. And if, if that's the only thing you had on your tombstone, that'd be pretty cool. But Mike Connor had a lot more than that. When he inherited the governor's office, he was, uh, when he was elected to the governor's office, he inherited a $14 million debt. The state was in debt. Our schools were not accredited anymore. The colleges, state, Ole Miss, Southern had lost their accreditation, uh, and that was what he took over. And by the time that he f served out his term in 1936, all those problems were solved. We had a surplus, and uh, our schools were accredited again. And, and uh, Governor Winter has told me often that Mike Connor was Mississippi's finest governor. If he was better than Governor Winter, he was... He had to be mighty, mighty good. Uh, so I wanted to begin today's program to, to talk a little bit, bit about the beginning of, of the beginnings of the conference in 1940 when Mike Connor and his secretary formed a two-person staff on the 13th floor of the Standard Life building. Uh, I want uh, Bob, I thought you would be good to speak to this is uh, uh, I know there's a, a story about when Huey P. Long came marching at the head of the LSU band down Capitol Street and uh, stopped at the governor's mansion when your grandfather was the governor. Can you take over from there? Is this working yeah, now? Working. Okay, good. <clears throat> well, I'm a lawyer, so let me stand up. Um, <clears throat> my earliest recollections of this story, you have to understand it was secondhand because I never knew my grandfather personally. Uh, but I, much about what I learned about him was through my grandmother. Uh, she lived in the house I'm living in now on North State Street, and um, she and he moved there after they left the mansion. So, you know, a lot of the stories I got were on her knee, uh, but one of the ones she told me was this story about uh, back when Ole Miss used to play LSU at the fairgrounds, at the old fairgrounds, and uh, there was, so I'm led to understand, a significant rivalry even back then, <clears throat> and uh, Huey Long, in, in a, a moment of trying to, outdo my grandfather, decided he would march the LSU band up Capitol Street and uh, have some revelry, you know, before the game. And actually got out, he had a had a white suit on from, from head to toe, white hat, white bucks, a cane, and he, <laughs> the band stopped in front, and in the, in the, then there was no fence around the, the mansion. So the, the band, the LSU band, stopped in the front yard of the mansion and began to play the LSU fight song. 
<clears throat> which uh, did not sit too well with my grandfather. I, I, I imagine that was the case. But uh, he walked up thinking that he was going to outdo him, so he walked up to the front door and rapped on the door with a cane, and uh, my grandfather wouldn't come to the door. So I just left him out there in the cold. So that's, that's the nuts and bolts of that story. When, when, I, when I say that uh, Mike Connor was a most remarkable man, consider this. When he was 24, he ran for the state legislature and won a seat in the House. That same year, actually he had turned 25, he was elected Speaker of the House at the age of 25. Pretty, pretty remarkable man. As I said, it was a two-person staff. It was, uh, it was uh, Governor Connor and his secretary ran the SEC out of that office down at the Standard Life Building. Uh, Greg Sankey, how how many? What does the uh, SEC employ now? Full staff. We're at uh, 40, 41 with an intern. And we have uh, eight other individuals who are uh, charged with overseeing our officiating programs who are independent contractors in different places. So a little bit, a little bit different. Could you imagine doing it with you and Catherine? Um, there are those days that might be much less complicated. <laughs> simply, simply the two of us. But uh, what, what's interesting, and I referenced it at the sign dedication, is that in the 40s, the, the foundation was laid for the responsibility that our office bears to this day. And I always think it's important, and since we're talking from a historical perspective, you know, the, the impact of World War II. So that's one element with which he had to deal with as commissioner. But the, the real consolidation of national authority, um, the uniformity across the conference's members at, at that time, which would have included Tulane and Georgia Tech, Suwannee would have departed at that point, so he would have had 12, is not something we think about today. So we have rule books, we have rules, um, we have standards and expectations, but it's not always been that way, and someone had to play a formative role in creating that reality. And, and Governor, then Commissioner Connor, certainly did exactly that during his tenure. I believe, I believe you said earlier that uh, Commissioner Connor was the one who brought the officiating, football officiating, under the conference office, right? Uh, that will probably make everyone here smile. Um, it, we actually have uh, an interesting project happening right now. We have records back to the formative meetings of the SEC in the early 30s, and we're in the process of digitizing those. So you can go back to meetings and learn when different actions were taken, the discussion around scholarships, um, and looking at uh, a PhD paper that was written by um, now a faculty member at, at a school in Ohio. He kind of summarized what happened during, era, during different eras, and one of the things that happened in, during uh, Martin Connor, as we've known him, now Mike Connor, as I've learned uh, his more familiar name, was to bring officiating in, which was, uh, you think about it now, you know, when all the schools picked their officials, at least one of the teams was happy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Now that the conference office has that role, no one's happy. But it goes back to the 40s and that decision making, which was, was well informed and perhaps a little bit different than tradition, but a needed change. Yeah. I think, Bob, you told me that uh, you've been through some of uh, your grandfather's files and that a lot of the, uh, what you've seen had to do with eligibility issues. And, uh, I believe that I gave you a copy of a <clears throat> onion skin, seven or eight page, probably two verbose legal document uh, that I found, uh, and I can, I, I plan to, I had multiple copies of it, so I do plan to give that to the archive, but the interesting thing to me as a lawyer was that it was written like a lawyer. It was written a lot of whereases and wherefores and that sort of thing, and it was 
it was interesting to me to read, uh, thinking, you know, this is this is sort of arcane, but it is very organized and in a legalistic sort of way. But it involved the first, what I can determine to be the first uh, eligibility determination for a Kentucky football player who was returning from World War II. And um, I think he came down on the side of making him in ineligible to play. And I don't know whether that's because he's for Ole Miss and didn't want Kentucky to have a, a player or what, but, but he came down hard on him and, and didn't let him uh, – took away his eligibility. Yeah. A lot of people would tell you had it been Kentucky basketball, they would have ruled otherwise. But I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> – that's not my editorial comment. Uh, I, I thought this would be a good way to illustrate how, how far the league has come in recent years in, in terms of, of just incredible finances. Uh, Larry, what was the budget, that your first athletic budget at Mississippi State, and what year was that? It was 1987, and the budget was seven. Point eight million dollars, and I thought we were rich. Hand that to John. <laughs> John, what's your budget today? Today, or when I took over, um, it, it, we're going to spend about about one hundred and ten million this year. What was it when you took over? It was ninety one million. That's a pretty big difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith. You played famously for Ole Miss under uh, Rob Evans and, and Rod Barnes, uh, and y'all had some terrific teams. But what, what, what changes, what's the biggest change you've seen in SEC basketball since you were a player and, and now that you are an administrator? What, what changes have you seen? Well, I, I think that um, <clears throat> you know a lot of credit has to go to the league office for for what we're seeing, in especially men's basketball right now. You know, I think there was a period of time in the last you know ten years or so where uh, the quality of play wasn't great. You know, we weren't getting a lot of teams in the NCAA tournament, uh, and and Greg and, and his staff have done a tremendous job of focusing on it. Uh, and it just goes back to kind of what we talk we've been talking about. You know, the creation of of our of our conference, the evolution of it. Um, and the you know the the ever um, you know just trying to improve constantly, and I think that's what we see from from our, our league office. But they've hired somebody specifically to oversee men's basketball, and that's been a, a huge help. You know, there, there's been administrators from each school that have been a part of the solution. You know, working on non-conference scheduling, those type of things, uh, and now you're seeing the fruits of that. You know, we're seeing teams that are getting in the NCAA tournament, more teams, more opportunities. But um, you know, I think the league right now, from top to bottom, is as good as it's, as it's been in a long time in basketball. Uh, we have great coaches, we have great players, uh, and that was really spearheaded uh, by the league office. Greg, could you talk a little bit about what you, that process of, of, of trying to reemphasize basketball in the SEC? I would, uh, I would attribute the, its formation to when, when Mike Slife serves as the, as the chair of the men's basketball committee at the NCAA level back in 2009 era. And we were probably in the middle of what I would consider to be a downturn. So we go back to 2004 and look at our comparatives nationally, and we were meeting our own expectations. We had number one teams. We had, you know, five, six top 25 teams. And then from about 2004 to 14, you can statistically see a downturn, whether it's NCAA tournament appearances or with a couple of exceptions, large progression in the NCAA tournament or just non-conference wins and loss records. And I think there were a couple factors there. One was the onset of the academic progress rate, which is not really interesting to anybody in the room, but it was an academic measurement the NCAA put in place. And we were, the bulk of our programs were close to like the danger zone or penalties where you wouldn't even be able to access uh, the NCAA tournament. And and so then you have to manage that. And I think at the same time, we hired some coaches who'd been successful really early in their career, wonderful people, but you're taking on the burden of leading an SEC program. And we went through that churn, and people are trying to figure out how do you cope with that. So Mike started to raise the issue about non-conference scheduling, which you can't just schedule tough non-conference games. You actually have to schedule quality non-conference competition and then win those games. So there's a, a two-part uh, 
not just objective, but vision. So we scheduled better, but didn't see a lot of progress. My first year, March of 16, we had only three of our 14 teams in the NCAA tournament. And that was a moment of change and, and really next level adjustment. Um, had an opportunity to bring in a staff member, uh, Dan Leibovitz. Dan coached at the college level. He was an assistant coach with John Cheney at Temple for years, if, if you're familiar with college basketball. Was a head coach at the University of Hartford. I don't know if there's any Hartford grads in here. I suspect not, but he, he dealt with what our coaches deal with on a daily basis, and, and that helped change the conversation. And, and I give credit back to our campuses for hiring decisions. You look in this state between, between Kermit and his success over time, you know, what he did on a year-in, year-out basis at Middle Tennessee is a tribute to who he is as a recruiter and who he is as a coach, and Ben at UCLA. But I first saw Ben Holland coach at Northern Arizona when I was commissioner of the Southland Conference, like in 96, 97, in Nacogdoches, Texas. He was a visiting team. And so with people like that who've, who've had long-term success, uh, who've coached at the highest levels, who've, who've won games in the NCAA tournament, that's happened around the league. So those decisions are important. And then one of the benefits of those budget changes, I don't know what kind of facility Larry was building on his seven point whatever million dollar budget, <laughs> but we've invested so that the young people have medical support, academic support, mental health counseling, uh, and facilities that help help build and magnify their success. Um, one of the highlights of my career in sports writing was that <clears throat> covering the SEC basketball tournament back when you had uh, – Wimp and Dale and Hugh Durham and uh, golly, C.M. Newton and I mean some really great basketball coaches and I think it was the time right after they were kind of filtering out that the league went down a little bit. You, you, I, I do think that 2004 year is important because you had some experience uh -huh. that there was a cycle, really. And you realize how important continuity is to success, so hiring the right person. Yeah. And over that period of time, um, Billy Donovan at Florida and Kevin Stallings at Vanderbilt were the ones that whose tenure spanned that period. Um, a side story, which is historical. So the, the sixth commissioner of the Southeastern Conference was a gentleman named Roy Kramer. Roy just turned 90. And a group of us traveled to... Uh, outside Chattanooga where we surprised him to celebrate his 90th birthday. And if you're in my role during football season, uh, uh, a conversation with a colleague like that is actually really therapeutic to find out the problems I have are much like the problems he had and there aren't solutions. Um, you're, you're managing issues. But he started telling stories. My purpose is he started telling stories about Dale Brown, about Hugh Durham, about Wimp about Sonny Smith and about coaches all across the league back um, in the late 80s through the 90s when uh, the conference's basketball, and Keith was a part of it. I actually saw that team play in San Antonio, as I recall, in the Sweet yeah. 16, um, not knowing that we'd be sitting here someday next yeah. to each other. But um, those, those stories, those legends are, are what has helped build us, even though we went through a little bit of a downturn, build us into what we are today, both in basketball and, and across the board. Yeah. One thing that I've seen from covering the SEC for this long, and I wanted to speak to Larry about this, is, uh, you know, when back in the 70s and 80s when I first started covering it, almost every administrator, athletic director, assistant athletic director, whatever, was an ex-football guy. It was all football people. Uh, and now, well, just look right here, we've got – an ex-baseball player and, and, and an ex-basketball player who are the athletic directors. Larry, how, have, am I right on that? Has that changed? Well, the first athletic director meeting I walked into that had 10 people, seven of them were head football coaches and athletic directors at the same time. Um, the other two guys were Cliff Hagen and Joe Dean, who were basketball greats, and I was a little sports information guy that had moved up. Um, I think I'm right today, Commissioner. The only AD that has been a former head football coach is Phil Farmer. So, yeah. The, the other remarkable thing that's kind of been consistent and 
particularly as we look back through the history for Mississippi State and Ole Miss, is from the very beginning, this conference made a decision that whether we were 10 members, we were 12 members, or we were 14 members, we were going to share the revenue equally. And that has not been consistent across the country in other venues. So I, I'm assuming, Commish, you could share what the revenue distribution was last year. I've moved on to this year. So <laughs> we, I think we put out, uh, what, $41 million. We make that announcement in January. So Larry, thanks for calling me out in advance for not studying. <laughs> 41, 42 million per school, and uh, we've continued to make progress. We obviously, one of the needs of having 40 staff is um, Governor Connor didn't have a network that ran 24 hours a day that created attention. And um, it's interesting, Mark Womack in our office has worked for five of the eight commissioners, which is a pretty good stat. And when he started in the late 70s, there was no men's basketball tournament, so we forget what it was like. There were no women's sports in the SEC in the late 70s. That, that happened in the early 80s. Um, and the NCAA would call every Monday in, in the football season and say, here's your one game that will be on TV. And, and now we're managing on a potential, on a Saturday, like this Saturday, 9, 10, 11 different football games through scheduling and kickoff times and, and who's where. So it's, it's a little bit different operation. Yeah, the, I'm glad you mentioned the women's athletics because that has changed even since I've started writing sports. I mean, we went from not, not having – women had no opportunities. Uh, uh, there weren't basketball, uh, softball, uh, track and field. There was, there was none of that. You just – you you were you finished high school you were finished and then uh, I think Title Nine probably was the most most responsible for the big change. Uh, how how close and the athletic directors can speak to this. How how, how close are the are the women's programs anywhere near close to self sustaining? As far as money, um, <laughs> How you gonna answer? Yeah, that's a. Um, our our women's basketball program is a great example. Um, you know, we will uh, we'll average somewhere between sixty eight hundred and seventy five hundred people per game uh, for the entire course of the year. We'll have probably three or four sellouts for our women's basketball. Um, we will, we will not break even, um, and I think it's because we have invested so much in the program. And we look at it as an investment just because we feel it goes well beyond just dollars and cents. Um, so just in terms of the, the net revenue, it, if, if you were a business person, you would say this isn't making the kind of money you would think or you would want it to make. But if you look at it from what our women's basketball program, and really, quite frankly, all of our women's programs do for our university. Uh, the way they represent our universities, the way they represent the state of Mississippi and our community, it, it's a very worthwhile investment, and, and we're very happy to do it. Keith, do you have anything to add there? Nothing really to add. I mean, that was said very well. But, you know, I think for us, we're, we're kind of in the same boat. You know, uh, our women's uh, basketball program, we hope in the next couple of years can – can get closer to a break even, but I think for us, you know, it's, it's giving young women the opportunity to, to play and to, to compete and to get a degree, um, you know, and, and to be honest, some, some of the women's sports are the most fun to watch. I mean, women's softball is so much fun to watch, so I think a lot of this is growing. It's going to evolve over the next several years, um, but I think just giving that opportunity and, and knowing that you know, we know football is, is kind of the one that drives the, drives the show and drives the train. And, you know, uh, as long as you're doing well there and creating revenue there, obviously with, with help from the SEC, you're going to have the resources to, to fund these women's sports, and, and we love doing that. Yeah. I, I, I think Mississippi, uh, as a state, we're, we're really second to nobody when it comes to uh, interest in and supporting college baseball. Uh, I think what Ole Miss and State are both in the top five nationally in baseball attendance. 
Southern Miss is in the top 15, usually nationally in baseball attendance. Uh, and yet, uh, and this is not a conference issue, understand, but, but, but NCAA-wise, baseball players, uh, most of them are on a half scholarship or less. John, I guess you'd be the first one to address it. I'm We're going to pass that over to Ron Polk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Or, or we could give it back to the former chairman of the NCAA baseball committee, Larry Templeton. But, but, but no, y'all go ahead. One of y'all, what, what, what's, well, what's the future of that? Well, I think it's amazing. You look at this state in the last, I think it's in the last 10 years in the state of Mississippi, all three, you know, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and Southern Miss have all been to the College World Series in a very rural, you know, sparsely populated state. I mean, we, we have been pretty dominant. Now, I will say Mississippi State's been to three of those, three World Series. Uh, yeah. I have to mention that. Um, but but I, will, I will say that it's a sport that's obviously near and dear to me. And, and yes, you guys would be in for a treat if Ron Polk were here today because you'd, you'd be here for a while. But uh, he... Um, and you know what's amazing is I remember my first head coaching meeting as a baseball coach in the SEC. I was at Kentucky at the time. And, I, <laughs> and our former commissioner, Commissioner Sly, would walk into that room, and you might remember this. He would walk up, shake everybody's hand, but he would give Coach Polk a cigar, and he would slide it into Coach Polk's pocket. And so I went up to Commissioner Sly, and I said, I'm just curious. I know Coach Polk smokes cigars, but why, why are you giving him a cigar? He goes, John, there's a chance he'll put it in his mouth. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story of that. But uh, obviously, the average college baseball player in our league is on 0.42% of a full scholarship. The average softball player is on 0.71. Um, so there... Just to give you an idea, I don't think it's fair in our state. It does produce revenue at Mississippi State in the sport of baseball last year. We brought in $3.2 million. I don't know what Ole Miss's numbers were, but I know that Southern Miss does a great job. They bring in a lot of crowds and make good revenue. And, again, those re that revenue just doesn't go to that sport only. It's shared. You know, it's kind of like the College World Series. Um, has made over and above $10 million in net revenue over the last five years, um, and that money gets shared among all the other championships. Um, I mean, with that money alone, you know, you, you could probably add some scholarship aid to each of the 295 schools that play college baseball. So I, I think there are some issues there. I, I think we're having great discussions. And again, I'm going to compliment our commissioner because he's right on top of it. He has led the parade for a third assistant coach in that sport, and he has, he has a committee right now in our league that is studying, you know, how we can get more scholarship aid to what's called these equivalency sports. Yeah. Larry, you, you were, were part of the – you were the chairman of the NCAA baseball committee when a lot of the expansion, expansion of the College World Series – televising of college baseball. Could you speak to that? Well, I think the best thing that happened for college baseball was uh, in the early 90s, the Southeastern Conference worked out an agreement with ESPN. Once they brought ESPNU online, that we would furnish them a Thursday night baseball game every week during the baseball season and the popularity of the sport of baseball nationwide began to pick up. Every other conference was jealous of that, but we still have that program through to the day. Now, the, the thing that's really made college baseball so great is our institutions have committed to baseball because they've seen what Mississippi State and Ole Miss and some other LSU and Florida and our league have done with college baseball that it can be a revenue sport. And you've seen what the facilities that have been built. Um, but we made a decision in the NCAA Baseball Committee that we had to either build a new stadium in Omaha or we had to move it elsewhere. And you got to congratulate the city of Omaha for stepping up and making the decision that build a new facility because what happened was we were playing in an old facility that when 
an institution would come play in the College World Series, you were only getting 300 tickets. Well, Mississippi State had a fan base of 10,000. Ole Miss would have a fan base of 10,000. And our fans couldn't go to the national championship. So the committee said, we've got to expand this program and we've got to get to a better facility. Um, I remember telling the committee one year that it was when the Mississippi State team came to Omaha, it was a letdown because our facility at Mississippi State was twice as good as what we were playing the national championship. So I give the Southeastern Conference credit for carrying college baseball for where it is. The other thing I think, Rick, that we need to touch on that these two guys are doing, I would say both of you got 300 athletes? A little, a little over 400? 365. 365, and they're paying the entire tuition in books, mills, and dorms, and that figure is a large part of their two operating budgets. But to think that we got 700 kids at these two institutions that are getting a free education, we don't need to lose sight over. Yeah. Commissioner, what about the uh, baseball? I mean, since you, how long have you been at the league? I know you Since 2002, and one of my welcome gifts was there was this, like, 12-page letter on my desk in early November 2002, uh, typewritten. And I read the first of 12 pages and realized that was written by a very angry person. <laughs> so I flipped back, and it was signed Ron Polk, the baseball <laughs> coach at Mississippi State University. It was about some of these issues that, that John has described. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I come to the modern era and work back, I think there are, are three sports that have really, really benefited from the SEC network. I think softball. Like women's gymnastics and I think baseball, because it, it has become more routine to watch. So Larry spoke about kind of a first step with a Thursday night game. Well, you can immerse yourself in the spring when the sun's out and the temperatures are warming in baseball, either in a stadium, which happens in great numbers, or on television at a high quality production with, with very informed announcers, most of whom have a legacy to this league and can tell a story from a different perspective. When I look from a policy standpoint, John referenced two parts. There's no disagreement, I won't get into the technical pieces about the number of coaches needed to coach baseball, for example, and that number is four, a head coach and three assistants. But the structure of that fourth is what we're arguing about. And it's, it's enormously frustrating given the commitment on our campuses that we're in this debate about minutia rather than just a vision. Uh, the, the scholarship model um, goes back to the early 70s and learning the history of why we have what are called head counts, which are full scholarship sports, if you will, and partial scholarship sports, otherwise known as equivalency sports like baseball, softball, track and field, learning that history and then thinking about what might the right vision be moving forward. That will take some time. We, we have a group excuse me, in the conference looking at that issue. I don't know the outcome. I don't know the national will to address it. But what's happening in the SEC in baseball uh, for decades has been special. And I'll actually go back to an experience that we all forget. So, again, we're talking about history. I was in Omaha for a men's basketball tournament, NCAA first round. I was out exercising around uh, what is now TD Ameritrade Park. And they have plaques honoring each of the World Series hosted in, in uh, Omaha. And you have to move to the late 80s to find an SEC team on that plaque. It, 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 we've become, I think, dominant, not, not winning everything, but certainly the most successful league in baseball. That's not, not something that was just given to us back 70, 80 years ago. That's been earned over time. And again, it goes back to the leadership on our campus and the fact that it continues as a tribute to coaching and support of our fans and our, our university leadership. Hey, Rick, let, yes, Rick would you talk about SEC Plus, what it means to the other sports? Sure. Um, Rick, thank you for giving away your moderating duties there. Okay. I, <laughs> I see everything here. to Larry. Yeah. Um, Larry asked about SEC Plus. It's really SEC Network Plus. So I, the, the way, it's a very young crowd here, it looks like. 
just your hair is prematurely gray like mine. Um, but you're all familiar that we're using our phones and iPads for different, different activities. And so I'm often asked, like, when are you going to put your games on Twitter or on Facebook? And, and the reality is we do that already. So you can, you're, you're able to consume baseball games, softball games, basketball games for men and women, even our football games, or watch your marching band perform at halftime of home games on what we call SEC Network Plus or the, the digital platform. It's now through the ESPN app, and you can watch in just as, as clear of you with the same sound quality. Uh, what's happening around all of our games. In fact, I'd argue you can judge officiating more quickly than the officials can judge officiating because you get to replay it on your phone if you're at a stadium. But it's an asset that will not diminish over time actually the access points to our, our campuses, our student athletes, and our competitions I think will be magnified through that resource over time. Yeah. Greg, uh, one thing I've written about this season and and in past seasons is I'm starting to notice I'm watching a lot more games on TV now than I used to. I used to be in a press box every Saturday and I don't, I'm not in a press box every Saturday now. I'm watching on TV and I'm seeing games, SEC games, where there are huge swaths of seats that don't, don't have butts in them, you know. Uh, or anybody. Yeah, or anybody, yeah, right, or maybe a purse, you know. But but what what I'm what I'm getting, I, I've always thought, and I that the oversaturation of TV is a primary cause of that. But at any rate, is it a concern? And and what what do you think about doing something about it? It's certainly an item of attention. And I believe we have to look factually. We have every one of our football games on TV. So we're talking about football, given what you've been watching this season. It is not new that every SEC football game is on TV. In fact, it's been that way for decades. Now, it may have had one game uh, available through pay-per-view. Uh, there may have been games on a syndicated channel at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. But we've had decades of every game being televised. So you have to walk away from it's just television and say what factors contribute and this is a an ongoing conversation among athletics directors we actually spend two days in late january talking only about football as a sport which i have a, a basketball ad and a baseball ad if you will but they're all sports and they know how as keith said how enormously important football is to our campuses and, and the lifeblood of our universities and, and they look at those issues, and they do the same in, in basketball, both men's and women's, in different ways. We have marketing directors who meet and talk about those issues. We've changed policies. So it uh, used to be if you were in a stadium and you had those beautiful big screens, uh, we wouldn't let controversial re replays be shown, but one time quickly. Uh, now you can make a judgment and watch five or six times the same video that a replay official is going to be seen so you can disagree as effectively as anyone with the outcome of, of the decision. The, the, the reality is there's something happening beyond just television. I think the experience is much better to stay at home than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, certainly 50 years ago. Uh, but time demands, perhaps more so than economic demands, if I gotta be at my child's soccer game or my grandchild's soccer game or you know, finally I get a day because of the intensity of work. How do we make our events more than just contests? How do we do things around campus? The, the Grove may be the best example of the country of making sure there's something special around what happens. Uh, when we bring SEC Nation to our campuses, that's part of making an event beyond football, uh, beyond just the football game. How do you help people in and out? We, we modified alcohol policies. There are two different approaches in the state. That's fine. Um, some people think that helps bring people in. Some people think it might keep people away. So we're going to experiment and see. Uh, but I, I think we have to be attentive to kickoff times. Uh, there's not like one switch I could flip mm -hmm. and solve aluminum views in stadiums or empty seats in stadiums. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something about which we're very conscious. So there are certain uh, opportunities to... To, to improve our situation available, and there are others that may take some time to, to determine the right course of action. Yeah. Uh, 
it's 12:45, guy. Uh, John and Keith both have planes to catch, and you're excused if you. Oh, <laughs> but you've got a meeting to get to. I want to appreciate both of them coming. I'm going thank y'all. Uh, we're going to open it up to the audience for questions here in a minute. I'm going to ask one first to Larry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Larry, a lot of people know Duty Noble as a baseball field, uh, as a name that's on the stadium. Uh, you knew him. As I knew him as a kid. I, I never worked for Coach Duty. I know that. Um, but Coach Judy was one of those old-time rough, wore the old flannel hat and jacket, never worried about how he looked, and uh, was tough as nails. He ran me and a bunch of other campus brats out of the old gym many times, said he didn't have time to pay the light bill for us to turn the lights off and get the H out of there. But uh, he, was a, he was a great administrator in that he could evaluate coaches and he hired some great coaches when he was the athletic director yeah he uh legendary character I, I was about this high when when i met him and uh i just remember the gruff voice and uh i've always loved the story about him uh and you know, a lot of people don't know this, but he coached at Ole Miss after he graduated at State, and then he went back to State. And, yeah, yeah. And many years later, somebody asked him something about Ole Miss, and he said, he said, well, I'll tell you this much. I know what hell is like because I coached in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go around the room, Chris. We got uh, 12 minutes. Both of these are for Commissioner uh, Greg. Uh, one, if you could add on to the uh, history page, which uh, did you have a, for the website, a little paragraph about you know the commissioner's office first being in Jackson in 1940, and I assume it moved you know, to Birmingham to be more centrally located. And the other one is actually, what about the possibility as it gets towards the end of the contract for Hoover, Alabama, hosting the baseball tournament, of possibly having member schools bid for the baseball set, South Station Baseball Conference tournament? Sure, uh, I'll take that suggestion. And Catherine's making a note about adding the, the Jackson, uh, Mississippi uh, office timing and, and purpose to our website. That would seem to be an adjustment that we can accommodate. Uh, we went through a request for proposal process in 2015-16 around the baseball tournament location. Uh, actually, I felt it was going to move. And the city of Hoover built... Uh, it, invested in a campus for us. And so we have uh, a few more years and we'll begin, I think now, talking about the future. Uh, one alternative I doubt will ever happen is being on campus. I think uh, from my perspective, what we've done in Hoover has become synonymous almost with Omaha. And uh, we can fit 17,000 into the stadium. We've built what is effectively an indoor practice facility. There's actually a warm-up field now that is the same geographic orientation and dimensions as the, the, the Metropolitan Stadium, which, which we play. So uh, I think our coaches are pretty comfortable there, and, and it's a, a fair question, but I think we'll probably be in Hoover for a, a bit, of, bit more time. Uh, earlier, you alluded to the uh, situation uh, with athletics during World War II. So I just wanted to ask about what were the, what was the effects on athletics in the SEC during World War II. And second, now that the ADs are gone, I want to put the commissioner on the spot and ask you to make a prediction for the Egg Bowl. To handle the prediction? Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, uh, I think he be, asked you. Yeah, the game's going to be on TV on Thanksgiving <laughs> night. Uh, I will predict, I'm going to predict that all the cables and satellites will work well. And beyond that, it's up to other people. Um, you know, I'm not the, the most detailed about World War II. It is interesting, though, that we're here commemorating the office location 
in a year where we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of college football and the SEC Network uh, produced 12 hours of programming documenting that history. And I think if you go back to episode three, it moves pretty quickly because you had a diminishment of, of people participating. You know, our, our, our young men were going off to war. Um, and, and that's just a fact. So the challenges around eligibility issues that were referenced uh, would have been novel and new, and there weren't any rules to cover some of those things. And, and then you had the influx in the late 40s of returning uh, soldiers who then built up our campuses, and that actually sustained into the 50s um, when, you, when you look at the history. But, but I can't imagine some of the challenges from just a personnel standpoint. You, know, you had General Neyland at, at, um, at Tennessee, and, and actually at top of the noteworthy uh, time frame, but then any number of other people had served in military um, situations. You talked to Bill Battle, who would have been after, but coached at West Point, and we forget in this modern era the, the compulsory military service that was part of a young person's life and would have altered their, their attendance patterns for a period of time. So that's like the, the general observation, but to lead through that era uh, was an incredibly significant task and contribution for the commissioners, athletics directors, and university presidents in this region. From Mississippi State's standpoint, we were on a two-game swing to California and our team was to play the University of San Francisco when the war broke out. Half of that team left from San Francisco to war, did not even come back to Mississippi. Yeah, I think something, a lot of, a lot of the great coaches of the uh, 20th century, Bear Bryant and John Vault, two that come immediately to mind, uh, coached military teams during the war. Uh, both of them did. And I'm sure there are lots and lots of others. And you'll, you'll find on the historic schedules that our universities were playing military-based teams yeah. during the early eras of college football. Yeah. This is a, a current issue that uh, I found of interest. Uh, Matt Luke was speaking Monday night, and he was talking about he has two athletes that are uh, two sport athletes. Uh, one of them is covered by insurance through, and this somehow is in coordination with Major League Baseball and the other didn't qualify. Could you clarify that a bit uh, as to how, how that works? And the school is allowed to pay for it, you said. I can clarify that which I know and probably make muddier that which I don't know. Uh, that which I know is through what's called a student athlete opportunity fund that is a chain of events from NCAA basketball tournament rev revenue and NCAA revenue distribution then to our campuses. Uh, we will have uh, athletic programs that purchase uh, effectively disability insurance for uh, prospects who are rated at a certain high level for the draft. That's been going on for years. I don't know about the mix with Major League Baseball. It may be that they have a draft projection that relates to an insurance uh, situation. So I can't speak to the issue generally, but our institutions have the ability to, to provide disability insurance. In fact, individuals who are rated highly can go out on their own and purchase that disability. And sometimes what's called the loss of value insurance, that if there's an injury, and someone were to, to decline in a, in a draft projection, then there might be some insurance payments from that. That second one is really tough to access. We've got some experience with that, but that's probably the best I can do in a general way. Um, um, from, a, from a conference point of view, could you talk just a little bit about this ruling that's come out of California on the player lot players getting paid and sure. and then if you could just squeeze a little in on the transfer portal in terms of just is this getting a little maybe top heavy or whatever does the conference have a position Thank well between you. those two issues you realize why there's more than two people in the conference office <laughs> um, so california has adopted the law the governor has signed that will allow in in the summer of 2023 from a start date student athletes to effectively go commercialize their name image and likeness um, 
this is not going to be resolved on a state-by-state -state basis. There are between 12 and 20 other states that have had legislators, not legislatures, legislators introduce their concept. New York has a bill that would allocate a percentage of ticket sales that would then be distributed among student athletes, not just at Division I level like us, but Divisions two and three as well. Um, the NCAA's had a working group looking at the issue, made some, some news about potential changes. Uh, I think the likelihood is you're going to be walking the halls of, of D.C., uh, communicating with people about a national solution if, in fact, the will is to change the financial support. Now, I, I'm one of those true believers that think uh, the financial support provided to student athletes, which there's no better time to be a student athlete than right now, the, the way young people are supported, but should be tied to their educational and athletic endeavors. And we have some favorable court decisions. We've taken positions on appeal. We have antitrust law that are realities and boundaries for us. And we're not going to escape that. Neither will the various states as they try to craft laws. This is not, uh, this is going to have to be a substantive, thorough analysis of Title IX issues, uh, of disparate impact issues, on, on budgetary impacts around sponsorships and opportunities to support sports in a great way. And, and that, that's not going to be solved. Uh, necessarily with just a, a, qu a quick political action. And I think we have to be attentive to this. Uh, we welcome the conversation and are prepared for the right kind of change, but also want to protect educational and athletic opportunities. Uh, you asked about the transfer portal. Uh, just one of the privileged things in which I get to speak from time to time. <laughs> so we, we've had, you could go back since we're talking history. 90 years ago in October, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Education took a, a, an in-depth look at college sports. And, and graduate school in the late 80s actually read the bulk of that report. And it's fascinating the language that's used and the issues they discuss. They talk about academic requirements for student athletes. Uh, there was a year uh, the word migrant showed up for student athletes, which is the word transfer we know now. So they were dealing with transfer issues. They dealt with um, health and safety issues around practice, around medical care, like the same issues we're talking about uh, today around compensation issues. And, and when you go back and, and look at the concerns that have existed over time about transfers, um, the portal is simply a platform to say, I want to leave. And people have wanted to leave their situation as university students or student athletes for as long as we've had higher education. That's not new. So the, I think the transfer portal creates a different focus. You can analyze the statistics. What, what has happened is we have taken away campus restraints. It used to be athletics directors could control destination, communication, and aid once you transferred. And I think we needed to move away from that. So you're not now seeing articles about coaches controlling transfers. And I think that's good for coaches, whether they all believe it or not. And then we have this portal, which is to say, hey, I want to go, which raises the attention quickly. And then we have a waiver process at the NCA level. And I think that is a problem and an issue that has to be addressed. It is, it is causing young people to walk into coaches' offices to say, I want to transfer. And the coach brings the compliance folks in and says, hey, here's the rules. And the first thing that's said back is, I'm going to get a waiver. And so we have young people not making decisions with the best available information. That needs to change. We also have universities writing letters and saying, you need to let them go because this, this, and this happened. And I think it's, it's fracturing relationships across college sports. Some of those are, are tough relationships anyway. And we have to be more attentive to that. And, and I've personally raised the issue with, with NCA leadership. We'll continue to engage in the dialogue. I think we'll have another year of this circumstance. And hopefully, we can, we can do some healthy work to help young people who need to be in a different setting make that decision. Uh, but also avoid some of the pitfalls I think we've identified. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Let's be the last one. <laughs> that is a giving man right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, I, I can appreciate the, the monetary uh, benefits of the SEC network and our contracts with CBS and ESPN and such that. And some, some though, have said we've sold our soul to the – to the television contract. I remember when the SEC uh, uh, first announced that the network, I was so excited that we were going to be uh, shed of those damnable 1140 Jefferson pilot games. Mm -hmm. 
and 11, 20, whatever, and, and we've, you know, we're now loaded uh, some more than others, I'm afraid, with an 11 o'clock game. Certainly you can appreciate that that affects attendance and, and taken with all the other things you're talking about, about the, the empty seats, has there ever been any thought to diminishing the number of 11 o'clock start time? Um, I want to praise you for clearly communicating your opinion of those. <laughs> I think the word damnable was the, was the adjective used. Um, um, we, we have had early kicks. I, I, I get a lot of feedback, but we've had those early kicks, uh, again, for decades. So this isn't actually an SEC network product. Maybe by 20 minutes, because we were kicking at 11, 20, 11, 15. I thought they were going away. No, no, no. You, we're going to have three games a day. We're not inattentive to the feedback, though. I'm not inattentive. But you are constrained by pre existing agreements. And when we have opportunities for correction in the future, perhaps, so I'm not going to overpromise, perhaps we can make some progress. And, and I'll offer an example. Um, I was at the Arkansas Old Miss game, which was a night game in September. It was hot then at kickoff. I think the kickoff was at 6. It was 96 degrees. So it's hot in September. Uh, the good news is I avoided any hurricane problems, but I was introduced to the new H word, which is heat. And, and we've, but we've been playing games at different times. Uh, a week later, I was in Starkville for an early kick with Kansas State, which was one nationally ranked team and one almost nationally ranked team. And, and it was a good, good visual to say we're going to have to continue to adapt and that we ought to be talking about can we improve upon the numbers of early kicks. Now, I, I will tell you, your damnable kicks will always exist, but can we look at, at, at the, the number of those and somehow manage them differently in the future? And that's, that's the challenge without overpromising. and I hope my mom's not listening because I used a bad word twice. <laughs> but it's his fault. I, I can't believe you didn't mention the fact that each school is getting a $43 million check. And a lot, and a lot of I that's... I do that in private, actually. <laughs> I, I know, Chris, I'm, can I say one sure. more thing? I, I just want to thank uh, everybody f for their particip participation, but particularly Greg Sankey for coming here today. This is a busy day at their office. We appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. It's another great program. It's a good season. If you uh, do not already follow us on Facebook to find out what, each week's new program is. You can keep up with us that way. We send an email out once a week. If you don't receive those, you can sign up for that over there and learn what all we'll be doing. We'll take a break until the early part of January. Thank you all for coming. If you need reminders about some of the other programs that are going to happen over the next few weeks, though, there's a Rack Card newsletter over there that will give you the dates for everything. Thank you all, and help me thank our panel and moderator today. <laughs>